This is Selma Schimmel at the Multidisciplinary Cancer Congress 2011 in Stockholm. Hello, Dr. Rugo. I'm very curious to know your impressions and thoughts about the breast cancer data that's being presented at this multidisciplinary meeting. Well, thanks for having me. It's actually been an interesting meeting for breast cancer after a somewhat disappointing ASCO and a series of less than positive trials, I think the most recent being the Iniprib trial for triple negative disease. We've actually had some uh, nice positive results here at uh, the ESMO ECHO meeting, which are, is nice to see, and I think it gives us some direction to go in, uh, which will be interesting. So why don't you expand a little bit on the sort of the talking points from the studies so our viewers can maybe even get a preview of what's going to be expanded on for us in San Antonio. The biggest trial presented on Monday at the Presidential Symposium by Jose Basalga is the first results of the Bolero 2 trial. Bolero 2 uh, was a randomized phase 3 trial, and of course follow-up is ongoing, uh, that was an international collaboration with steering committee members from all over the world, and actually I'm on the steering committee for Bolero 2. There is a Bolero 1 and a Bolero 3 trial as well that are being done in HER2 positive disease, and we haven't seen results from those trials yet. Uh, Bolero 2 randomized women who had progressed on an aromatase inhibitor, a non-steroidal aromatase inhibitor, uh, randomized those women to receive either exemestane, the, non, the, the steroidal aromatase inhibitor, with or without the mTOR inhibitor, Everolimus. Uh, and mTOR is an important pathway in hormone resistance. Uh, studies have shown, although at this meeting some of the discussants uh, brought up conflicting data from the laboratory, uh, but in general, uh, activation of the mTOR pathway is associated with upregulation of AKT as well and has been associated with uh, resistance to hormone therapy. Maybe not primary resistance, it's a little bit hard to know, but resistance that's acquired when patients uh, receive hormone therapy and then their cancers progress. So we had actually seen very intriguing data while the Bolero trial was ongoing. In December of last year at San Antonio, an investigator-initiated randomized phase two trial called the TAMRAD trial. And uh, that trial randomized women, again, who had progressed on a uh, non-steroidal AI to receive tamoxifen or tamoxifen plus Everolimus. Very, a much smaller trial, a little less than 120 patients. Uh, and the group was further stratified by being either hormone responsive with secondary resistance or those who never responded to hormone therapy, primary resistance. And they showed remarkable data with an improvement in response, progression-free survival, and although they weren't powered to look at it, overall survival as well. And at this meeting, they've updated that data further, looking into more detail about the group of patients that had primary or secondary hormone resistance and showed that the primary additional benefit of Everolimus was seen in patients who had secondary resistance. So hormone responsiveness, developing or acquiring resistance potentially through activation of this AKT mTOR pathway, uh, PA3 kinase, and then overcoming that resistance with the addition of Everolimus. So the Bolero 2 trial uh, came out of a lot of interest in studying mTOR inhibitors in hormone receptor positive breast cancer and a neoadjuvant trial that I also participated in published by Jose Basalga that looked at patients receiving neoadjuvant, letrozole, and randomized them to receive Everolimus or not. We showed a better clinical response. It was a little hard to show anything different pathologically and it wasn't our primary endpoint. We showed more drop in proliferation measured by KI67 with the addition of Everolimus. So no specific group was selected. Patients were randomized and uh, received Everolimus at the standard dose with dose reductions for toxicity with exemestane or a placebo with exemestane. So it was a blinded placebo controlled trial. So the data presented here showed a marked increase in the primary endpoint, which was progression-free survival, both by investigator assessment and even a more dramatic difference by central assessment. Uh, so that's very good information. The primary endpoint was by investigator assessment, but you like to have that confirmation with the independent review. The trial also showed an improvement in response rate uh, and time to progression. So 
very good positive results. It's too early to show any survival data, and San Antonio will have five more months of update. One of the questions that comes up is what is the toxicity from this treatment? And it's interesting that although we saw the same kinds of toxicities that we've seen with other Everolimus studies, the investigators quickly became uh, uh, adapted to managing the toxicity of the Everolimus with dose reductions or holds. So although we saw more stomatitis, the rate of grade three stomatitis was only 8% uh, and managed reasonably well with dose reductions and holds. So very impressive data. There was a little bit of phase two uh, data from India looking at generics, a generic tamoxifen and a generic mTOR inhibitor, serolimus, uh, that suggested that also the addition of the mTOR inhibitor to tamoxifen, regardless of a hormone resistant or hormone naive population, played a big role in improving outcome, as measured again by the same kinds of parameters, response and then time to progression, progression free survival. That trial wasn't reviewed centrally, and we need more than a 10 minute presentation to really understand what those data mean, but still it's in the same vein and encouraging. When you talked about it, it wasn't, it wasn't a huge number of, of patients when you talk about a study being powered. As it, the research progresses, does that mean more and more patients will be now recruited into a study? No, not necessarily. I mean, the reason to recruit patients, you know, the reason, the way you decide on the number of patients to recruit to a study has to do with your statistical assumption. So you say, I want the time, the progression-free survival to improve from this to that. That's a certain percent improvement, and I need this many patients to show that by this period of time with so much certainty. So that's how you decide on the numbers, and you base it on what you think the control arm will do from other published studies. So obviously your statistics are only as good as your previous published studies and if everybody keeps doing the same thing, which they don't always do. Um, the issue is that you want to minimize the number of patients you have in a study as much as possible because it's a lot of effort for the patients. Uh, you don't want to enroll too many patients and show that one arm is clearly inferior because you haven't done a service to those extra people you enrolled. It's very expensive and more time consuming to enroll studies with more patients. The downside of smaller numbers is that we don't power, as I was using before, the, the word before the trial, to look at overall survival, for example. You need many more patients if patients are earlier in the course of treatment to power for survival. One of the trials we actually saw a little update on at this meeting was the EMBRACE trial that looked at the chemotherapy drug uh, derived from the marine sea sponge, a halochondrin analog called eribulin. And uh, eribulin was compared to the treatment of physician choice. And uh, that trial was unique, and many other trials have jumped on this bandwagon now, in that patients were treated uh, who had received two to five prior lines of therapy. The median number of cycles that patients had received was four. And that trial was powered for survival, but it needed a much smaller number of patients because it turns out that if you're earlier in the course of treatment with advanced incurable disease, you need many more patients to show a difference in survival compared to patients who are closer to the end of life, which is a sad but true fact. Uh, that data was updated, as I mentioned, Fatima Cardoso from uh, Portugal actually looked to see whether or not it mattered if you'd received the drug before that was in the treatment of physician choice when you compared the benefit of aribulin. And it turned out that it was hard to make any real comment on that. It, it was suggested that the big benefit was seen when you were re-challenged with a similar drug, but the numbers were so small, you couldn't really make a lot of that difference. It just appeared that aribulin had a better outcome, indeed, compared to treatment of physician choice in that trial, even if you broke it down by having been exposed to the drug before. The other interesting study that was uh, presented at this meeting was a phase two trial of TDM1 uh, versus trastuzumab and docetaxel as first line therapy for HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. TDM1 is a fascinating agent. It's a, a microtubule inhibitor, a very potent toxin that can't be given by itself because it has hepatotoxicity. 
uh, and bone marrow toxicity, and it's linked with a strong, a potent linker uh, to trastuzumab. And it's actually a small amount of trastuzumab. It's not the therapeutic dose. And the trastuzumab targets the uh, derivative of metensine, which is the chemotherapy agent, directly to the HER2-positive uh, cell, so-called smart bomb effect, or as Martine uh, Picard uh, I think mentioned in her discussion, a bullet without the gun, which <laughs> is less surrounding damage is what I got out of that. But uh, this trial, which was done again as a global trial, was presented by uh, Sarah Hurwitz from UCLA. And uh, it showed a, a significant improvement in TDM1 in terms of progression-free survival, which was their endpoint. They have previously presented toxicity data. Edith Perez presented that information. Uh, but the data is quite, it's a phase two randomized trial. It's not a huge number of patients, uh, but a little over 100 patients, but really a dramatic benefit to TDM1. Now, one of the things is only somewhere between 17 and 20 some odd percent of patients had ever been exposed to trastuzumab, and there was a little imbalance between the two arms. Obviously, we need the phase three trials, which have are completing accrual now, and we'll have data from next year to give us the final word. But I've been very involved in the earlier trials with TDM1. It's a very potent agent, extremely well tolerated. And the exciting thing about TDM1 is it's chemo without, again, the gun. You don't lose your hair. You don't get mucositis. The major toxicity, actually, more neutropenia with, tax, with the docetaxel, but more thrombocytopenia with the TDM1. And that's going to be the biggest issue we're going to uh, need to watch for with that drug over time is the drop in platelets and how that affects response to other treatment. So I think what you've done for us is uh, two things. You have sort of given us the chronology of a trial, and you've given us a teaser for our next meeting with you coming up in San Antonio at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. It'll be a pleasure to talk to you then. I think we'll see some really interesting updates and some new data as well. Thank you for taking time out, Dr. Rugo, to give, you, give us your impressions of breast cancer here in Stockholm. Thank you.